Uh, CG people can also double click that to maximize yeah, it. Uh, so I think we can get started. Uh, so uh, for the next session in uh, the, the puzzle track is uh, uh, it would be uh, talking about a storage in uh, sorry, a bookkeeper in a, in a, in cloud. So uh, Salesforce has been kind of using uh, Pulsar and join uh, uh, the uh, bookkeeper. Sorry. <laughs> uh, Salesforce has been using Bookkeeper for uh, uh, many years, and they have been involving in the development of the Bookkeeper community. And uh, today we we are really glad to have uh, the whole um, uh, Salesforce Salesforce team here to uh, present their story uh, on running Bookkeeper in in the cloud. So I'll just hand over the session to the team. All right, thanks, CG. Um, and hi, uh, this is JV. And uh, today we are going to um, talk about, you know, as CG mentioned, um, how the Salesforce uh, has built a massive distributed storage engine for Apache Bookkeeper. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is the team. Um, myself, JV, um, and along with me, uh, Charan Ankit. Karan and Anup are going to talk through uh, today's um, session. Next slide, please. Um, so this is a very high level agenda. We'll start with the introduction of the Salesforce use case, and then a brief introduction to the bookkeeper. Uh, and then we'll go on to like how we have enhanced the bookkeeper to take advantage of the public cloud, um, especially in the public cloud, the availability zone model. And how do you, how we use the availability zone model to build a robust, uh, fault tolerant, and durable distributed storage? Um, and the cluster, this distributed storage cluster built on Apache Bookkeeper, is zone aware, and uh, with the with the zone aware placement policy. So I'll talk through uh, these use cases and the placement policy, and finally we'll conclude with the takeaways and uh, and and the future. What are the next steps? Uh, next slide, please. So first, let me start talking about the Salesforce use case. It's pretty simple, right? So um, we want to build a massively distributed storage system uh, with tens and even hundreds of petabytes even can go uh, more than that for an internal transactional store. Uh, we have an internal transactional store that needs this uh, storage. Next slide, please. So let me start talking about what is the uh, Salesforce requirement, storage requirements. Um, we have two kinds of uh, data streams. One is uh, the write ahead log, uh, and the other one is the regular uh, data stream. So these two needs, storage needs of these two um, are completely different. Uh, the write ahead log, as we all know, that it needs uh, extremely low write, write latency. So a record uh, should be Return to the storage and persisted on the storage uh, with extremely low tail latency. And when we are recovering, uh, we need to read uh, back the wall with extremely high throughput. So it needs to have extremely high read throughput. The flip side on the data streams, we need extremely high write throughput. So, so the entire stream needs to have extremely high throughput, and latency is not a big deal here. We don't we don't really care. But when we are reading um, this transactional store, when it is querying the data, it needs to make sure that it can query and read the data at the random. Random read should be extremely low latency. So as you can see, the needs of these two data streams are ex completely different. And the store, a store, what we need should have a support for both of these things. And at the same time, there is a general storage needs, right? It's not just a performance on, say, on the thing. All our data is immutable data. So once we read it, write it, we'll never, we'll never modify that. And we would like to have a store that supports the immutability throughout the stack, right? Um, and, and the storage needs to be extremely durable, available, and performant. Uh, th and the next point, which is very important, is that it's easy to operate. So, so we are a you know um, a cloud company, and we would like to make all our services are easy to operate. And of course, 
it needs to scale out to massive levels. As I said, like, you know, hundreds of petabytes um, or even more to start with, right? And and then we don't want to run on any um, uh, specialized hardware. So we want to run on the commodity hardware. And let me start with the, um, these are the requirements. So we'll, we'll, I'll start with the bookkeeper introduction. So next slide, please. And let me talk with the storage concepts of the bookkeeper. So there are like two major, uh, you know, pieces that we need to understand. The number one is the entry. And the number two is the ledger. Entry is the smallest unit of data. You cannot write or read. Uh, you, you need to write or read at the en entry level granularity. And each entry is represented by an entry ID. And, and the entry, once it is written, it is immutable. So you cannot go and modify or change the data that you wrote. And the next one is the ledger. Ledger is a stream of entries. So you can keep on appending one entry after another entry to make a ledger. And it only provides the append interface. Um, and uh, and of course, you can have a random writes too, but like, you know, you are not able to like go and delete an entry or something like that. And it is rep represented by a ledger ID and the ledger is deletable. So, so once you can write the entire ledger, you can delete it, but entry cannot be deleted, right? So you cannot, you cannot delete uh, one entry in a ledger. These are the basic concepts. And then we have like, you know, a very simple, uh, how, how it is stored is that we have three concepts that you need to understand is that the ensemble, right quorum and the act quorum. The ensemble is the stripe size. So, so in a massive cluster, we take, you know, ensemble size of bookies, and then we stripe all the entries across uh, this ensemble size. And the right quorum is that like how many copies, how many replicas that we want here, and the act quorum is the minimum number of replicas to satisfy the client write request. So in this example, I took the ensemble size of five, right quorum is three, and the act quorum is two. So you can see that Entry one is striped across book is one, two, three, and entry two is two, three, four, like that. And as long as soon as we get two acts from the two bookies, we satisfy uh, the client's right request. And this is extremely important because these quorum rights will give us very low tail random uh, right. I mean, the right, right latencies. So go to the next slide, please. And and here, like going back to like here, I would like to compare and contrast like the, our storage requirements and then how the bookkeeper supports, right? So so the bookkeeper is a highly consistent, available and durable uh, log based store. And as I mentioned, the data is immutable and append only store. So this kind of required uh, satisfies our requirement that we need an immutable storage. Um, and the bookkeeper, another uh, you know feature of the bookkeeper is that it's a thick client with extremely good placement policy. Because of the placement policy, it is flexible enough, which we'll be talking a little bit more later. It's extremely flexible enough to achieve a high durability and availability uh, with the placement policy. And the low latency rights, as I mentioned that we have a quorum based right. And also you can offer speculative reads, like you know, you have more than one copy and then you can have an effective read um, without with much greater performance. And if some reason that copy is not reachable, we can have edged reads to go and get the data from other copies. Um, and as I mentioned, stories is organized in the form of entries and ledgers. And also it offers the guarantees, right? So once we once we write and and then act to the client, the data is persisted and the order is guaranteed. If you write an, an entry n, all the entries up to n minus one are successful and persistent. And once we read it, it is always readable. These are the guarantees that are crucial to us. Next slide, please. Um, and, and this is the very high level uh, Salesforce use case, right? So this is the uh, Salesforce cluster at a glance in a very simple diagram um, where we have multiple clients here in this case, transactional store and each store shares the same cluster. So there are a bunch of stores that are sharing the same cluster and the data. And we have distributed book, bookies across multiple zones in a Kubernetes cluster. Um, and each bookie with has its own persistent drive attached to it. We made the entire cluster in the <clears throat> and the clients are zone aware. And because of that, we are able to uh, direct the IO streams intelligently to avoid cross zone latencies. As you all know, cross zone latencies are pretty high in the, in the public cloud environment. 
and we have enhanced the data placement engine uh, so that we can achieve uh, you know um, uh, the AZ and AZ plus one down failures and we can keep the service up. So in order to achieve all this, uh, the basic fundamental need is to have the knowledge of the location, where I am, right? Each component's location should be part of its identity. And Anup will talk how we have achieved uh, the identity. Anup, please take it on. Yes, thanks, JV. <clears throat> so I'll be speaking about the bookie's identity in the public cloud. Uh, when we think of that, before, let's just step back and think about the public cloud availability zone failures, right? Um, so if let's take a look at this article from Wired Magazine, which clearly states that managed AWS outages are responsible uh, for a lot of failures, and it is the responsibility for the designers of the code to actually design around these failures. And we just have to assume that uh, the substrate can be faulty at times. Uh, this tweet basically said that a computer in Reston with a bad power supply is what you call as cloud. Uh, things such as Azure and other cloud substrates are also equally faulty at times. And customers are impacted by all of these things very significantly. Uh, even something like Netflix uh, during Christmas had an outage, uh, and because of which they had to stream uh, basically a pre-recorded fireplace video uh, for their customers instead of them enjoying their usual uh, content. So all of this goes to say that public cloud uh, substrates have failures more often than we would like to admit. And we want to kind of design for these failures from the app level, from our side. And Apache Bookkeeper is a storage system, which is the ultimate source of truth for many upstream applications. So for Bookkeeper, we not only need to make it zone aware, but we need to make it fault tolerant across zone failures. So to start with that, we need to understand <clears throat> that we consider an availability zone as a fault domain now. Currently in Bookkeeper, we have a fault domain as a rack, but now we have to expand that definition and think of an availability zone as a fault domain. When we think of it that way, we have to distribute our ensembles across these zones and in such a way that we maintain the quorum ratios which JV previously talked about. While doing this, we obviously need to keep in mind the different complexities about this, such as cross-zone latencies, complexity and cost, et cetera. So coming back to the original point as to how can a bookie know where it is in this public cloud environment? So if we kind of just think back a little bit, uh, there's a concept called cookies, which is very similar to web browser cookies, which is basically we store the state of a, uh, of a session or something like that. But here, this is with respect to bookies. So in bookies, uh, whenever a new bookie comes up, its identity is registered in uh, the metadata store, which in our case is Zookeeper. And this identity is stored in form of a cookie. So a cookie will have uh, details about a bookie, such as the name, instance ID, cluster ID, those things, uh, the ledger directories, and a snapshot of the file system of the storage system which the bookie has. Uh, it is generated when a bookie comes up. And then it is used to verify the cluster membership of the bookie every time it is restarted or if there are any changes in the storage system underneath it. So this being a central place for a bookie's identity, we thought it would be the right place to store its location within the entire cluster. So how do we even get this detail about the bookie in the public cloud? So I'll hand it over to Ankit, who will go over how we understand where the bookie lies and how we store this info in the cookie. Over to you, Ankit. Next slide. Uh, thank you, Anoop. I'm going to go over how we uh, get the location of the bookie in the public cloud uh, previous slide, actually. So I'll go over the brief overview of what we did to enable the bookkeeper and the bookies to be able to do this. So, so we determined the network location of the bookie, that is the location uh, and the fault domain and the, basically the availability zone that the bookie is present in, in the um, public cloud cluster. And we rely on the Kubernetes API to get this information. We uh, then step two, we store this information of the bookie uh, so that we do not have to retrieve it repeatedly from the Kubernetes API. So this is useful as the location of the bookie gets fixed once it comes up. 
And finally, we make this available to the client, I mean, like, uh, which can make decisions about like where to read and write ledgers from. So to do that, to do the step one, to get the location of the bookie, we rely on something called Kubernetes mapping. So there were two ways we could have gone to determine the network location of a bookie. We could either get this information directly from the public substrate that we are using. We could query like the public uh, substrate uh, information for that particular node, or we could get this information directly from the Kubernetes API. The second approach offered us a couple of advantages in the sense it allowed us to fetch this information in a cloud agnostic way. And uh, we did not need any credentials to be present on the nodes to be able to get this information. So uh, we went with the second approach and we added this class, which is able to talk to the Kubernetes API and get this information. Now, since we have this information, now we want to persist this. So we don't want to retrieve it repeatedly. So to do that, what we, uh, next slide. Uh, to do that, we added a field in the cookie known as the network location. So just had bookie, instance ID, ledger uh, DIR, and general DIR. The fifth field is the network location, which stores the region, zone, and something called an upgraded domain of the bookie. So uh, the cookie is created when the bookie is initially brought up and it's stamped on the bookie itself. So the bookie stores its network location. We also write this cookie to a central metadata server so that other clients like which uh, want to talk to this bookie can retrieve this information from there. So uh, we also added like manual user commands to update or modify or even view the cookie. So now that the, uh, we have this information available in metadata server, we want the clients to be able to access this. So to do that, we added a mapping class called cookie-based mapping, which is capable of retrieving the cookie from the metadata server and allowing the clients to read it. So uh, this can be used by placement policies, which wanna get, decide where to place certain a ledger or to be our clients, which wanna read the ledger so they can make decisions about uh, where is, which bookie is the closest to minimize uh, latency. And now I'll hand it over to Charan to talk, talk about placement policy and that we use. Go to you, Charan. Okay, thank you, Ankit. Uh, so in this section, I'll explain in detail uh, how a zone aware placement policy is designed and how it would uh, work uh, to serve our purpose. Okay, so as JV mentioned, a bookie per client is thick client and bookie per client is the one which forms the ensemble when ledger is created. So this uh, zone aware placement policy is purpose built placement policy designed for a uh, public cloud architecture. So it is a two level hierarchical placement policy with the upper level being availability zone and the second level being the upgrade domain. So as you all know, availability zones are isolated locations within data center region from which public cloud uh, services operate. So the uh, second level upgrade domain is uh, more of a logical concept and its purpose is to support uh, parallel patching for bookie nodes. So te uh, technically it should be okay to bring down all the nodes in the upgrade domain for parallel patching. And during this time, uh, system should be available for serving the traffic. In AWS uh, uh, infrastructure, so uh, placement groups can be leveraged to define these upgrade domains. Okay, next slide, please. And also, JV has uh, explained briefly about the quorums of a ledger. So now, when a client gets ledger create request, uh, client is the one which forms an ensemble using this placement policy. Uh, for uh, zone aware placement policy, uh, following configs define the uh, criteria to form an ensemble for the ledger. So the first config, uh, minimum number of zones per write quorum, uh, it specifies that uh, within a write quorum set, uh, which is basically the replica factor uh, of a fragment, um, bookies, uh, uh, this config defines uh, uh, how much bookie should be distributed uh, at least across these many number of zones. So basically we can uh, configure this to uh, some values say like two. So we are saying that the fragment should be written to at least two zones. 
and the second config enforce strict zone aware placement policy this uh, config specifies whether to enforce strict placement or not if there are not enough bookies for whatsoever reason across the zone uh, to form an ensemble ledger creation would fail with not enough bookies exception so here we are uh, enforcing that uh, the placement policy should be honored uh, if it couldn't find uh, uh, bookies across the zones then the ensemble creation or the ledger creation would fail in this case and the third config is enforce minimum number of all domains for write so um, as jv explained uh, uh, the acorum is the minimum number of responses the client should wait for before acknowledging the right to the uh, client so this is uh, uh, enforcement uh, enforce minimum number of all domains for write is extra condition on top of acorum this config specifies for the client to acknowledge flagment right on top of getting ag quorum number of rights they should be from minimum number of different zones so we can say that getting a uh, two uh, acknowledgement is not sufficient but these two acts should be from two different zones so that way uh, we are making sure that uh, fragment is persisted across not only two bookies but they belong to two different zones as well and the uh, regarding uh, upgrade domains uh, so if in a right quorum set uh, for whatsoever reason if bookies are picked from the same zone then this placement policy will try to pick bookies from different upgrade domains and at least they should be from two different upgrade domains this is again uh, to support the uh, parallel patching so now we are making sure that uh, if bookies in a right quorum set belong to the same zone then they are distributed across uh, at least two upgrade domains so if one upgrade domain is brought down for uh, whatsoever reason then uh, there is at least a copy in that zone now karan will explain what are the uh, other other additional advantages what we are going to with the zone aware placement policy thanks sharan i i will go on describing the advantages of multi ag architecture next slide yeah so the first thing that we want to do is since the data is replicated across multiple bookies we want to select a bookie that minimizes the read latency while also minimizing the cost to serve the data back to the client our data is currently spread across multiple availability zones and so we have an ordering defined in which uh, to follow the ordering and then we will be able to get the data back as fast as possible in the minimum cost as possible so the ordering starts with the following priority the highest priority is given to the data which is present in the local zone and there are less requests pending to that bookie right so bookie is not overloaded and the client knows that uh, this is the local zone and that is guaranteed or it's it's most likely to serve the response back and fastest back to the client if the request fails in the local zone for whatever whatever reason or if it's slow then we can issue another read and this time the read will go to the remote zone with a bookie which has less number of requests attached to it right so the probability of getting a response is higher but with a higher latent uh, but a bit more latency penalty over there if both of those options fail the third try happens from the bookie which is in the local zone but has an history of a failure right so we don't want to attempt the read from a bookie which has a history of a failure and we keep track of failures that we have seen previously and basically what we are trying to do is improving the probability of getting the data back and if none of that works then we take the hit and we go to the remote zone with a failure or a pen or bookies which are heavily loaded so making the order the decision in this order will ensure that we get the data back as fast as possible while min, min, minimizing the cost next slide
there's another important scenario that we need to handle with respect to availability zones is that availability zones as a whole can go down because of disasters, power loss, or manual failures, or some of these issues which Anup already described. And AZ failures can be temporary or permanent, right? So we want, we don't want to transfer a whole lot of data for re-replication when the AZ is down for temporary reasons. Since bookies are distributed equally across three zones, that an availability zone approximately represents 33% of our capacity. So in order to combat that problem, we have devised a mechanism to detect if a particular availability zone is down or up. We use a simple formula. The formula is basically calculating the percentage of bookies which are up in a particular zone, right? And if the percentage of bookies that are up in a particular zone exceeds a high watermark, and high watermark is a configuration value. So if if it exceeds the high watermark, then we make sure that the like then we think that the zone is up. If it exceed if it falls below a low watermark, then we declare that the zone is down. And when zone is down, we make sure that we don't re-replicate the data for that particular zone. Because if we re-replicate the data and the zone comes back up after a few hours, then it's just more data transfer and it just costs us more for no real reason, right? So, and and then sometimes it it's also possible that the AZ is permanently down, like a disaster, like completely swept up the availability zone. For those type of patho pathological scenarios, we have a manual shell command, a bookie shell command, which an operator can go and trigger on required basis and ensure that the re-replication happens and the data is still durable and uh, available in every respect. Next slide. Yeah, uh, I will take over and then uh, talk through uh, the takeaways and conclude our talk, and then we'll open up for the questions. Next slide, please. So, so basically, what we are trying to say here is that you know Salesforce uh, started with a requirement for the uh, storage engine, and then the bookkeeper came very close to what we wanted, and uh, and then we started uh, you know enhancing the bookkeeper and started contributing the community, uh, and we have started with the uh, you know first party with our own data centers. Now we are moving into public cloud, and the bookkeeper architecture is flexible enough and extremely adaptable uh, for us to provide uh, the ways you know to adapt in the public cloud too um, and with the availability guarantees and the durability guarantees and the performance that we needed and we have talked through that and also um, uh, our team talked through like how we are uh, made how we have made a bookkeeper to sustain az and az plus one failures I'm not sure. I mean, I just want to touch like, you know, what is an AZ plus one failure is. So um, most of the public clouds has like at least three availability zones and each availability zone as, you know, uh, our speaker said, are, you know, extremely independent uh, and, and geographically distributed. When I say AZ plus one failure is that one AZ is completely down and another component or one bookie or in another AZ also down. When that thing happens, we should be able to provide the same level of guarantees on the performance and uh, durability and the availability, even at that kind of a failure. Uh, the AZ plus one is extremely important because like when the AZ is down, you can still come, you know, continue with your patching, continue go with your upgrades. All the service needs will can continue to happen even on the face of AZ failure. So, um, and those are the main important takeaways that what we have contributed to uh, Bookkeeper community in the recent days. Um, this is great, right? So, so this is what brought us to the public cloud. But is it what it is, right? But the in this explanation of the architecture, we are not really taking advantage of the public cloud matured services. So, so we are just like you know running our own VMs with a network attached storage, and then we are running our own stack, right? Yeah, maybe we are using the Kubernetes service, but not really the storage services. So 
how can we make use of the stable cloud services? For example, like, you know, the object store, right? So like in the, in the, in the case of AWS, it is S3 and Azure and GCP and everybody has their own object stores. And these are the staple storage uh, engines of these public cloud services. They're extremely durable and super low cost. I mean, all, all of us like, you know, who has experience with the public cloud knows that there are like, you know, uh, this is this is super good uh, service that we should make use of it. Well, it's great. Um, it's low cost, durable and available, but does it serve our performance needs? It does not. As I mentioned, like we want extremely low write latencies and extremely low random read latencies. Um, and, and then another thing is that public cloud store costs are extremely tricky. They charge you like, I, I, I mean, like, you know, um, I learned a lot uh, while, while, you know, exploring in the public cloud where whenever you cross the zone, it is not just the latency you'll be charged, uh, you'll be, you'll be, uh, you'll be paying more money too, like to, to, to transfer a byte back and forth from the AZ. Um, and, uh, and, you know, like uh, S3 or like you know, any of these object stores are extremely cheap, but they charge for the access costs too. Like how many times you go back and forth also matters. So, so you need to make a model of uh, your architecture where you want to take advantage of the public cloud services, but at the same time, you need to make sure that your performance goals are met. So, so we are thinking of uh, coming up with a hybrid system where we can take advantage of the backend and put something in the front uh, to serve our performance needs. This is uh, very early on in this project. And I hopefully like in the next Apache Con, uh, we should be able to talk more details on this thing. So at this point, um, you know, I would like to thank you all. Uh, this, this is our contact, by the way, if you want to reach us. And uh, thank you all for um, listening to us. And uh, we'll open up for any questions. I know there is a Vinod is asking. Uh, with AZ plus one failure, there might be a high read latency. Um, I'm not sure, Vinod, what do you mean by that? So, so we have three copies, at least in our case. And with the AZ plus one failure, um, right? So, so the plus one is going to be very temporary because of our um, uh, upgrades or like you know uh, any of the patching is going on. So, at any given point, we should have two um, copies across two AZs, and uh, we should be able to get uh, you know uh, the read latencies um, as we wanted. Um, if that does not satisfy your uh, question, maybe you can ask or uh, ask. Uh, Add more details to your question. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Uh, maybe I would ask a question. Uh, are these changes uh, pushed upstream already? Uh, most of these changes are, and some of them are not. Uh, and we'll we'll work on pushing them upstream, CG. Okay. You can't you can't put us on spot like this. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank uh, thank you for the uh, the whole kind of sales boss uh, like bookkeeper team here, and I think you can also find them uh, in the bookkeeper Slack channel, and if you want to connect uh, with them. And uh, any more questions? uh if no i think that that, uh, that would be the talk for today and uh, uh things uh the whole team again i'm not, I'm not going to t call a name <laughs> one by one but thanks the whole team and uh i think for the next session uh i think we we uh it will we will be come back on the kind of in an hour or so because there was a mistake that we made in the postal track there was one session was double book uh, between two tracks so and that that session was removed so there's a gap between uh, now until like an hour later so we'll come back in the uh, puzzle track and uh, uh, thank you thank you everyone yeah thank you, yeah. Thank thank you. you. Bye -bye. Bye. thanks guys thank you.